Hey, everybody. Welcome. My name is Noah Askin, uh, and I'm actually affiliated with two institutions. Um, I am an associate professor of organizational behavior at INSEAD, where I direct the product management executive program. Some of the reasons, one of the reasons many of you are here today. Uh, and I'm also a professor of organizations and management at the University of California, Irvine, which is where I am right now, which is why the sun is coming in in the morning. Um, I imagine it's dark where many of you are, um, but good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, and welcome to our INSEAD Digital Tech Talk X the what present and near future of product management. Yes, the title is a bit of a mouthful, but we wanted to let you know in our title that we're going to be covering uh, quite a bit of, of ground today and to give you an overview, uh, maybe an introduction for some of you to product management and a sense of what things look like on the market for those of you that are interested in getting into this field. Before jumping in, However, we did want to put a little plug for something that we've been doing at NCAD now for five or six years. Um, it's the product games, and the finale is coming up actually next week, uh, realizing that things on the blockchain, crypto, NFTs are having a bit of a... Uh, an interesting moment at right now. Uh, however, it is uh, part of INSEAD's mission, right? Business as a force for good. Part of the product games this year, the main theme is NFTs for good. And to actually tell you a little bit more about that, we have one of the organizers uh, of that event, uh, Nikhil Samuel. Nikhil, do you want to chime in and talk to us about that just a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Noah, for um, for this. Um, so I'm part of the uh, IND club at INSEAD, and, and we're organizing the sixth edition of the INSEAD product games, along with the TMT club and the INSEAD digital team. Uh, we're very excited to for this event, and there are 50 teams that are participating this year, and we have four finalist teams that are going to be here in Fontainebleau on the 23rd of November. And as uh, Noah mentioned, the theme is NFTs for good. And we have four teams from Cornell, INSEAD, London Business School, and the University of Cambridge Judge Business School. And they will be pitching their products this year. So um, we will share the link for the live event that's happening next Wednesday. And uh, we're hoping you'd be there. So if, you, if you're interested, please register. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Nikhil. Um, so yeah, just a, a plug again to sign up for that, to watch the fi um, finale. We've got a bunch of teams coming and, uh, and pitching their products. Um, okay, so I am now going to share my screen and kick things off a bit more. Uh, the link is also in the chat. You'll see it there. Okay, hopefully you're all now able to see my screen. Um, and so it's it's really my pleasure to to introduce uh, a very interesting panel. This is a group of people that I have presented with um, on a number of occasions about this very topic. Um, and I will get into each of their bios in a little bit, and I'm really going to leave the bulk of their introductions to them. Um, did want to say that uh, this is uh, these tech talks, and this one in particular, is done in partnership with Accenture, who's part of the sponsorship. So we thank them. Um, and without further ado, just want to want to dive in and and get going. So here's where we're headed. We've already done a little bit of introduction. Uh, we're going to have Rafael Leitritz uh, give a product management overview. He was a senior product leader at Google, spent a lot of time at Google, uh, and now runs Peak Product. Um, then he'll turn it over to me. I'm going to talk about what are the career paths maybe look like as you move up the uh, in the product world. Uh, and then we're going to turn to the head of the Berlin office of Egon Zender, Mark Kremlowski, to talk about talent trends in the market. And then, like I said, the last 30 minutes are going to be Q&A answering your questions. Um, so, but by quick introduction, uh, Rafael is a senior partner and executive coach at Peak Product. Um, he's been in product for many years. He'll tell you much more about that. Um, and he's going to give us kind of a nice overview of what it means to be a product manager, uh, acknowledging that there are multiple definitions. Uh, basically, there are as many definitions as there are companies that are doing product. Um, myself, I'm a professor and I direct the product management executive program at INSEAD, uh, which has been my route into this community over the past uh, six or seven years. Um, and Mark, like, like I said, is the head of the Berlin office for Egon Zender, which is a leadership consultancy and, and an executive search uh, organization. And so, like I said, each of us will, will introduce ourselves a bit more and kind of why we're here, what we're up to. Um, but I want to start by turning it over to Raphael, who's going to give us an overview of product management. Raphael, all you. 
Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to talk, you know, to students or to the to the to the wider school. I mean, I'm very passionate about this whole topic, and you're gonna see hopefully that I'm excited about this. And there's so much I want to share, or you know, so many experiences I've made. So. Um, maybe a little bit about background um, if we move on. So I've spent actually, like Noah said, a lot of time at Google. Actually, I had a, I had my own company before INSEAD. So I'm not only a corporate guy and I'm actually now running a startup as well. But I think relevant for this discussion is that I worked a lot of you know years at, at, at Google. For example, I was running as part of the early team of Google Maps. And I mean, I think you all hopefully know Google Maps and use it. I'm sure you've used it. And it's uh, that was an amazing privilege. You know, work on a consumer product uh, really in the early days. This was before mobile. This was before the iPhone. Even we started the work there, and you know, and really riding the mobile wave. Um, that was amazing. And then I've done one other big thing at Google because I've done the B two C angle well at uh, with Google Maps. Uh, I really also wanted to learn a bit about the business aspects of Google. So I joined as the global merchant lead for Google Shopping which is uh, Google's e-commerce business. And so we're connecting users of Google with merchants that you know have something to sell. And was also an unbelievable ride uh, on the business side, like this grew from about 5, million, 5 billion when I joined to about 20 billion after about six years. So a huge, even for Google standard, an amazing thing. And a very nice contrast for me, you know, because B2B is obviously very, very different than, than B2C. Long story short, um, I've then left Google to actually devote my time 100% on this because it has been a passion for me even before Google. It has been a passion a while at Google. And even while at Google, by the way, I started a conference. It's called the Product Management Festival. We just last year had the 10th anniversary. We do it in, in Zurich and in Singapore. And one of my motivations was that I, you know, I felt I learned really a ton, good or bad at Google. You know, I had my, I had my successes and failures. And I thought, you know, having a forum where people can grow, learn, and share experiences would be a worth, worthwhile thing. So jumping into the topic now, let me start with sort of a, a definition of what is actually product management. And there's one quote that I really like uh, because it, I think, summarizes a lot of what I feel product management is. So product management is the art, science, and practice of making successful products and making products successful. Um, so let's go a little bit into the details. There's a lot of, I think, captured in this in this here. Um, if you stay on the code for a moment. So I think, um, first of all, you know, art, science, and practice are very different things. And so what I, what I wanna say with art is, you know, there's something you can, I mean, PM is actually, product management is something that is teachable a lot. That's why we do the insert program. That's why we did the conference. But there's an art aspect to it, which is, I would say, it's like artistic in a way that, you know, you first really have to understand from a user perspective, what is, you know, what people want, right? What is a desire, a value, a job to be done at a client? And that's not something you can just do in theory, right? There is a, there is a process. I, I think that's where it's similar to an artist that, you know, create something. So it has clearly this creativity aspect to it. That's something I love. Um, and, you know, if you used, I don't want to use the cliche Apple product, but it's one of the many examples, right, of a delightful product where you see the art. But there's also then science, right? And science, um, and you, you know, I'm sure you know those terms, right? There's data analysis behind, right? There's testing, A-B testing, things like that. There's market analysis, there's product market fit, which is also an analytical thing you have to do as a product manager. So I love this, the science piece of it. And there's also a practice to it. And what I mean by practice, you know, there's something about processes, you know, there's something to be, you know, there's something at this point, you know, that you could say is a best practice, something about people, there's something about culture. So I think it's a very compl complex thing. It's a very powerful thing. It's all en encapsulated in that statement. Now, if we move on, where is actually product management, you know, um, where do you put that, right? Or where do companies put that? And I would say a good way to frame it mentally is um, it is not a silo, you know, it is not a function. It's not a department where you say, okay, you folks do product, right? It, it can be in a way that, you know, you can have a CPO, you could have like chief product officer, you could have a head of product or a VP of product that runs it, but really it sits between functions, right? And um, it, it, it really often encapsulates, encapsulates, of course, the customer, this is the art piece that I talked about. It has a lot, you know, 
to do with business. This is, you know, business models. This is, of course, business planning, company goals, product goals, in, especially in small companies, product goals and company goals are often very, very related. And then there's a big technology component to it, right? So really, I think it's it doesn't mean that it's not a function. I mean, it's it's definitely something that is you can put into a team or a person, but that team is much more connecting the dots than just running thing, you know, A to Z in, in their own team. If we move on, and uh, another nice view I like about um, here, right, is like there is, you could say there are two spheres to it. And the left one uh, is, I think a nice frame here is building the right product. And the right one is building the product right. And these are vastly different spheres, right? So if we stay on the left one for a moment, building the right product, what is really important here, right? This is this is all about customers and customer. I don't mean abstract bias, right? This is about users. This is about something. If, 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 if you have a product that you really like, you know, I don't know, a TV, a car, a phone, you know, or a software or an app, it's often, you know, it's not a coincidence that you like it, right? There's, there's something about understanding you as a user. There's something about, you know, researching that. There's something about constantly improving what people like and dropping things that people don't like or don't, not use. And this is, there's a lot of iteration in this left sphere. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of, you know, like I said, art in, in really closing the loop with users and first defining the what. So the, the whole left side for me is the what. And if you don't get the what right, what you're going to build and what the right product is, right, then the right side doesn't matter because then you're on the wrong track. So I think that's very, very important to understand that um, it's, it's first the what, the innovation piece, you know, and fine tuning that. And then the right side, you know, is a lot about processes, design. If you heard about methods like agile, uh, if you, you know, of course, engineering teams and all of that, that's a lot about the how, right? And it's it's important in the execution. But again, I think it's very important to say to see that if you don't get the left side right first, then you can still waste a lot of time and energy on, on the right side, right? And one comment, by the way, because I worked a lot, in, at, obviously, in the US and globally with Google, but also I work a bit more now in Europe. Actually, European companies often get the right side, very right, like process, you know, efficiency and all of that, um, but they don't get the left side right. I think it's actually often blind to the, to the user piece and to the innovation piece, whereas I think the US especially the Silicon Valley, right, in the Bay Area have really cracked the left, left one much more. So that's maybe something we could discuss at a later point. Okay, moving on. What can you, what can you expect if you, uh, let's say you were to introduce product management, you or you, maybe your company, right, or if you, for the first time you want to work with this, what sort of the pitch to executives, what they can, what they can expect. So it's a lot about turning your company into a customer-centric organization, because then back to the spheres, you know, you get the how right, right? It's hard to go wrong if you if you follow the customer, right? So that's very important. And they are specifically, right, it's often about solving a specific problem, right? And then let the product be so good that it drives value and growth uh, um, out, of, out of that, right? I sometimes joke, you know, you cannot PowerPoint your way or business plan your, your way into a great product. So I think that's really behind this, right? It, it has to be almost uncovered. Uh, what what the right product is, but then there is this this you know this focus on customers and, and journeys and you know really not giving up and actually building something great, and, you know. And this great piece is a lot of work. It's not something. It's not a it's not a spark, right? We sometimes again back to Europe. Often there is this mental image of the light bulb moment, right, or the spark. That's that might be the case sometimes, but it's not the rule, right? The rule is you work hard on something and shape it and refine until it is great. Um, and with that, by the way, one I think one of the promises I've seen really delivered at, at good companies is they have a constant stream of innovation, right? So it's one thing to have one genius product, right? But growing that product or maybe having a second product or a second product line, right? So like do it repeatedly so they can rely on it as a driver for growth for the company, right? And, and kind of more revenues and more business. That is something again you can do better or worse, but in in a in a good case you can you can to some extent expect that from the company and the process, which I think is very very critical, right? Since many of us compete on products these days, right? 
Um, many companies have figured this out. I, mean, I don't have to bore you with details, but we all know them, right? I mean, Google, Apple, many others, Tesla really have, you know, in, and I think ingrained this, this product first thinking. And um, I ha even have a few numbers and I don't have to go deep now, but I think it's pretty proven at this point. Logically, I think that, you know, good products lead to good growth and then lead to company success. Uh, maybe final slide on my end, um, what are sort of best practices and what to keep in mind, right? Um, if you if you do that and if you introduce product management, um, I would say one thing is talent is extremely important. And what I mean by that is back to the spheres, right? For example, if you have someone that says, oh yeah, easy product equals agile. Agile is a method, you know, to implement. And, and then they think, okay, so if I'm just agile, meaning, you know, I, I iterate quickly, then, you know, problem solved, right? For example, that might be, I'm not saying agile is, 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 could not be helpful. I'm just saying the person you trust with, you know, kick, kicking this off and you're implementing it, that it's very important that they get this right. Really that they have the full picture, that they have, you know, experience in the whole cycle of delivering innovation. Um, and I really have done that, right? So I get back to my personal motivation because I've, I learned at Google from amazing people, uh, many of the early founders or early stage folks at Google. And I, I was just, you know, extremely motivated by that. And I think, yeah, talent is very important. It is tough, by the way. I want to say even, and you, you all know, right? Google, I think Google is actually a good example of a company that had a lot of successes maybe in the first 10 years, so that I would say the last five years are not a great example, right? And so you see it there, Apple constantly has to reinvent the company. It's a constant pressure, you know, on, on churning out good products. Um, and often, you know, companies, it's not always a given that companies get that, right? I think back to Europe, even, uh, I, I see this really a lot, um, you know, it's still, but there's a business mindset, right? There's the business planning mindset, the budgeting mindset, and there's not per se nothing wrong with that, right? But again, back to my point, joking, right? You cannot business plan yourself to a great product, right? Just because you have it on a slide doesn't mean it's going to be successful in the marketplace, right? So I think this this learning and also the, the patience that comes with it, tolerance for failure, the, you know, this constant refinement, and pushing through that cycle with all the, you know, empowerment that has to come to the teams, that is not something that you can just switch on overnight. So it's a process. I mentioned empowerment. It's a very important one. I think that, um, you know, company gives, gives that product team, the patience, the mandate to try things, right? And again, with trying comes failure and failure is good. It means you shortcut it something, right? You're not, you know, exhausting the whole space. You're just focusing on what, what works. Um, and by the way, just, where you put that function right i think the whole cto thing for example is still something i see in, in in europe and mark will talk about it i know it's it's a bit of a i think chicken and egg thing if you put it under technology what you're going to get is technology right so i think um my my recommendation at this point is you know product should be either c level or should be at least very closely linked to c level uh, and ideally the CEO should care about this, right? Because every company is to some extent a product company these days, right? So it needs the support from the top management. It needs a culture. It needs a um, risk-taking culture. It needs some, some sort of encouragement for, you know, the whole team and company to rally around that. Um, uh, you know, again, learnings, learnings should not be seen as a failure. Learnings should be, should be seen as something, you know, to improve on. Um, so this whole cultural dimension, I would say, is one that, I would say, especially in Europe, we're maybe at the point where many, many get it uh, mentally or intellectually, but then they still might struggle in implementing it. But if I think back five years, uh, and let alone 10 years, it, we've come a long way as well. Right? So I'm, I'm very happy with that. That is my quick intro, and I would love to hand over um, to folks now. Great. Thanks, Rafael. Really appreciate that. Really nice overview of uh, a lot of the what, a little bit of the how. Uh, obviously, if we can get into the how that could take weeks, months, years um, to really dig into the how of product management. And so we'll, we can come back to it with questions. Just as a reminder, um, you do have the Q&A box there. I see a number of you are starting to ask some questions. Um, 
Mark and I are going to do some a quick presentation of our stuff, our topics, and then we're going to open it up to that. So we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Um, and so what I want to do is to take the kind of immediate what of product management, right? The specifics and the nuts and bolts and a little bit of the culture and, and organizational structure around it and just say what, what happens down with a product career, right? Especially when as you move up the ladder or, uh, or switch companies and, and take on greater leadership roles, because this has been my my path into product. Um, just by way of quick background, that's me. Um, I was at INSEAD for eight years, um, affiliated both with INSEAD and now UC Irvine. Um, I taught in the core. Hopefully there's some of you on the call. In fact, I know there's some of you on, on the Zoom right now who have taken my courses. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, some of you may have even taken uh, the product management executive program, which, like I said, is how I got into this in the first place. Raphael and his partner from uh, Product Management Festival came to INSEAD and said, we think that there's this need in the marketplace and we're looking for leadership development uh, skill sets. And, and this whole world of product has really opened up to me in the last uh, six, seven years. And it's been really interesting to see it both in Europe uh, and globally, and then now in the United States as well. Um, and, and my route in, and I'll explain where this kind of comes from, is I'm a network scholar. And so I study the structure of organizational networks and inter intra-organizational networks um, and what's going on inside organizations as well. And product in many organizations occupies this kind of unique uh, location in an organizational network that provides lots of opportunities, but also lots of challenges. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of what this career is like um, and, and what product leadership is looking like. So I went, I go to Google uh, terms and basically want to see how, what's happening over time as far as these terms uh, around leadership positions in product, chief product officer, head of product, VP of product. You can see over the last five years, there's been a gradual upward trend. Um, and, you know, they're reasonably popular, especially head of products taking a big bump. Um, just a general upward movement, but not a huge amount of growth in the last five years. Uh, but what's interesting is when you compare this to product management, sort of the general idea that Raphael was just talking about, it dwarfs all of that. And so, <clears throat> you know, we know that product management is relatively new. And yet product leadership is even much more so. And so is much less on people's radars, on companies' radars. Um, and it's, it's what does it mean when something is so new? Well, lots of things, but one of them, and in, in research, we talk about organizations that are startups suffer a liability of newness. Uh, and this is no different in professions and careers. And what do I mean by the liability of newness? Well, it means because this is such a new thing, right? This product leadership type role, these, these roles, basically it means people don't know what to make of you. Um, people don't know what the definition is, what your job responsibilities are, what are you expected to do, those kinds of things. And so it becomes very, very hard to do that kind of job. And so even if you're a product manager, there's still some newness to that as well, especially in lots of, of organizations that have been around a long time and haven't had product in the organization. There's that liabil liability of newness too, but taking this lens might help understand why so many companies often struggle with this. Um, most of the large kind of legacy organizations are very new to this world, um, whether it's as product managers or product leaders, and that comes with a host of challenges. Um, and just to kind of drive that point home, um, here's a quote from uh, a consultancy, Hydric and Struggles, um, talking about the emerging, the emerging role of chief product officer in Europe. This comes from 2020. Uh, the quote, given the variations in CPO roles, company leaders in any sector who are considering adding a CPO have no standard model, models to follow. Lacking a clear definition of their roles, there's high chance that new CPOs, that's chief product officers, will be dissatisfied and ineffective, leading to higher turnover. Um, right? So that liability of newness, there's not models to follow. There's not expectations as one company looks to another organization that does this particularly well in their industry and says, okay, that's what we're looking for for ourselves. Um, and because Mark uh, from Egan, Egon Zender is here, I also wanted a quote from, from them as well. Didn't want to just put up a quote from their competitor. Um, and so this one is actually a great one as well, coming from the chief product officer of Calm, which is a meditation and mindfulness uh, app, um, which I'm a user of, and I think it's very good. Uh, the biggest misconception is that the product role has a clear definition of success. There's a common belief that the product leader is the quote unquote CEO 
CEO of the product. Uh, you'll hear that term a fair bit. But when I ask CEOs what they expect from their product leaders, they usually stumble and end up talking vaguely about communication and vision. Revenue or any other hard financial target never comes up. It is crucial as a leader to have clarity on what role you want the product organization to play. It can range from general management to project management and anything in between. And so there you see not only the struggle of being a product leader, but also a product manager and trying to understand within a given organization, what is my role? What is my responsibility? Who am I supposed to re report to? Am I just pushing projects ahead and driving features? I saw somebody asked a question about an organization that's a feature factory, right? Am I just trying to add features and make sure that, that the sales team and marketing team are happy? Or am I actually engaging with customers and users and really trying to be strategic in how I develop and build products? Um, and that's true at no matter what level of product you are in. Um, and the challenge, and, and I really like this, I was listening to a podcast, this is now like, I don't know, three or four years ago, uh, the A16Z podcast, Mark Andreessen, uh, his his VC firm, and they were interviewing a guy named Vijay Balasubramanian, who was the head of product and the founder of Pindrop, which is, a, I believe, a security organization, like a tech security organization. And he said, what is it that he's looking for when hiring a VP of product, right? What is the skill sets, the expectations? Um, and, and I liked what he had to say. He said, they're looking for somebody who has the brain of an engineer, who has the heart of a designer, and who has the tongue of a diplomat. Now, if you think about those three skill sets, they're not very often contained in the same individual, sometimes not even in the same team. Uh, and so that can be very challenging. And then I added my own to this, having now talked to lots of product le leaders over the last half decade plus. And I would say that you also need the herding skills of an Australian shepherd, because very often people in product, whether it's a product manager or a chief product officer, you don't have the kind of formal authority that you might need to get done the things that need to get done to build the right products, right? And to build products right, as Raphael was saying. And so this is a very uh, diverse and challenging skill set to develop, and not a great deal of people do that very effectively. And so those of you that are in product already or thinking of getting into it, it recognize that this is a very, very difficult uh, career to take on. It's a rewarding and challenging one for sure, but this is a very difficult set of skills to, to combine in one, um, but it's also a wonderful challenge, I think. Um, and then coming back to this, you know, we've got limited models. But what that means is that there's also opportunity, right? You've got this limited models to look for what's successful. You've got a diverse array of skills skills that are required, although that will vary depending on the company. Um, and, and as Raphael pointed out, you're, you're beholden to lots of different people in the organization. And so with limited models, lots of skills required, answer to a lot of different people, that puts product in a very unique structural position in organizations. As I was saying, my route into this comes from being a network scholar and product sits in what we call broker roles. For those of you that have been in any of my courses, you have surely seen something that looks like this. Uh, and what do I mean by broker or brokerage, which is what product often does, right? It's just bridging two or more unconnected groups, right? The business, the sales and marketing, talking to customers, talking with the engineers and technology. That's hard because you have to code switch. You have to speak different languages. They have different demands, different incentives. And you and product need to wrangle those people to create products. It's not so easy. And so that's a big challenge, but it's also an opportunity. We know from years, decades of research that people in brokerage positions, they end up being more creative. They end up getting more opportunities. They're much more innovative. They tend to be to rise in their companies and be valued more, but it's also a very, very difficult position to be in because of all these diverse uh, stakeholders that you're having to manage and wrangle all the time. And so, you know, this is, uh, on one hand, it's new and it's challenging. On the other hand, it presents a great deal of opportunity, which is, I think, why so many people are, are so excited about it. Um, and so to, to take this idea of the skill sets and, and those of you that want to transition into this as a potential career, I want to turn it over to Mark from Egon Zender, who's going to talk about uh, talent trends in the marketplace. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Noah, and uh, super happy to be here and bringing in a client perspective and a perspective for market trends. So Mark Malowski from uh, Egon Zender, leading the Berlin office here, where we focus mostly on technology, working over the last years with startups, with scale-ups, and with mature companies from all kinds of environments. 
And that's actually a good bridge to what we see in product. So um, as mentioned before, it's a role which developed strongly uh, in EMEA, probably a bit later than in the US, for example, that's what we see. But we saw a constant growth of demand in the market for product roles. And then recently, uh, over the last 12, 24 months, we saw a big, big pickup uh, in interest for product roles. And not only where we have seen it historically, which was digital and technology, but actually in traditional companies, non-tech companies, and which was remarkable also, for example, in established multi-billion e-commerce companies. And that initially surprised us because we see them as digital and we say, um, and we wanted to understand why do they only now install senior product leaders uh, in the company, in the C-level. And one observation we made was that uh, in, on the, in the US, many companies are actually founded by product-minded leaders, whereas in Europe, many digital companies or e-commerce com e companies were started by more business-orientated uh, leaders. So hence, there are companies which grew with a strong focus on uh, supply chain or category management, but only later, only now, are adding um, a product perspective to the top leadership team. And if we go to the next slide, uh, what we often have uh, are discussions with um, CEOs, with investors, um, with other stakeholders, and we try um, to jointly get to a common understanding of what are the different routes that lead to a strong product leader. And that means also to understand that your new CPO, your new, your new chief product officer might not even have the title of product manager beforehand. He or she might come um, from a role which might be called, for example, chief digital officer or, or else. And we broadly put it into three routes which lead to um, uh, product. One is um, people who actually started in product management was one of the um, mentioned by Raphael, uh, established um, uh, product organizations, and then they move up there. Then there are uh, actually many uh, pr product leaders start on the left side, on the software development side of things, where they start as an engineer, and then often combine it, uh, combined with then uh, doing an MBA, they switch to the product side of things. And then there's the third group, more on the commercial side, coming from strategy consulting, from marketing, from sales who um, actually gain a strong understanding of the technology side and then make the move over to um, product. Um, and with this discussion, um, uh, we come to the next set of questions on the next slide, which um, uh, is also a discussion we often have. And that some, I think it also came up in one of the questions, which I saw popping up. Um, it's many clients which are new to the topic want someone with a very specific industry expertise and we often feel and we try to engage in that discussion that uh, it's a missed opportunity if, if you only look for talent from a very narrowly defined field which is very close to the, the field the company is operating in and you do not consider um, um, candidates strong candidates from adjacent fields um, because we believe product management is a skill set which is very transferable, going as far as taking um, uh, candidates with a strong B2B focus and bringing them into leadership roles in the B2C space. We have seen this work and we believe it makes sense. The other uh, area to consider, and these are the discussions we have with clients, is around the scale of growth and the face of a company, right? There are some um, more creative uh, product management talent and product management leaders who love building new stuff constantly constantly, and to actually get bored if it's too much of a going concern, non-innovative situation. And that might refer to the product development itself or the company situation. So we try to really, when speaking with um, candidates for such roles, to really understand where they're, what they're good at and where they get energy from and how to match that with the needs of the respective roles. Another um, topic also actually relates to one of the questions that was asked 
yeah, are we talking about someone who's really good at adding features or actually held responsibility for an entire product or actually for a set for a product portfolio? Um, and then the last one where we, where we, the last point where we do a lot of um, probing with candidates and also with clients is around what has the person actually done? Because it's nice to be associated with a big known respected product in the market, but we try to go deep on what's the actual person's uh, contribution. Um, and it's important to have these discussions also with CEOs and with investors in order to not make uh, superficial hirings, which are then often regretted. Coming to the last slide of mine um, is the CPO to CEO career track. Historically, that's been a not uncommon route, I'd say, in the technology and on the digital side of things. But we see it now uh, with the importance of the area that um, product focuses on. It actually makes the CPO an absolutely important and valid candidate for a CEO succession role. As the role is new to some companies, um, the CEOs and the boards need to consider what do they need to expose a product leader to when they really want to um, make him a, a valid candidate for the CEO role. And a thing to consider there is that many CPOs are very used to um, being in the network, being collaborative and doing uh, and be focused on influencing. But there are CPOs even um, in senior ranks who not necessarily have led larger teams directly or have held PLs. So when we discuss with companies um, the eligibility of CPOs for the CEO role um, or, and the track there, if you wanted to create a development track, we speak about what can they be exposed to in order to learn and add certain skill sets in order to make them ideal candidates for a succession. And we see this now across industries. I pause here and hand over to Noah. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you, Raphael. Um, why don't you, yeah, join. Thank you very much. I see that we've had a lot of questions, which is great. Um, we will do our best to get to them. Um, and the way to do the best way to do that is to have a look through. If you have a question you haven't asked yet, uh, look through the questions and upvote the ones that you think you're most interested in. Um, and we'll try to do our best to go down the list and get to as many of them as possible. So um, kicking off, um, this one received the most uh, upvotes. What recommendation do you have? Whoop, they're moving around. What recommendation do you have for a PM working for an organization? organization that has for over 20 years fallen into the trap of being a feature factory? This is a question that both Mark and I referenced. Um, and especially if the PM is not empowered to make final call decisions. Um, I suspect this is probably a question for you, Raphael. Um, you know, how, the feature factories are, are, it's a common sort of pejorative uh, in the product world. Um, how do you think about that? And, and, you know, as someone that works with organizations trying to build better product teams, how do you approach organizations that operate like this? Yeah, I absolutely feel for you. I'm I'm sorry to hear that, and and it is something we see over and over. And I I, I should say again, and unfortunately, it's something I see a bit more in Europe. But the general pattern I think that is described here is essentially an organization that looks to the engineering team and the product team as essentially churning out stuff, you know, churning out features. So if you, if you remember my two spheres, right? I said. Uh, kind of the what, what is a good product and then building the, the that product in a good way, that is much more, you know, about the execution of things, right? And I think the, the issue we're seeing here is that, you know, apparently this company is not thinking about the what first, right? And think about, you know, what is the stuff we want to build, but instead, you know, more measure it maybe, I don't know, in terms of, you know, frequency of launches or, or stuff like that, right? So again, something I, when I say, you know, you no know, companies are learning. This is exactly the learning curve I'm I'm referring to. In terms of practical advice, I mean, number one, I think a, a key lever here is top management. You know, and understanding that um, there's a great book called Empowered by Marty Kagan that talks about you know the right setup for product management teams. 
It's actually also a message to the leadership of the company he sends in this book, right? Essentially, it's about give folks room, space, and a mandate to actually do the left side of the sphere, the innovation piece, the thinking about the product, the, the discovery of the product, and only then, you know, churning out fix. One very tactical advice that I've seen working in those um, challenges is to maybe carve out an innovation team or sort of a new thing where maybe risks are contained and you can prove something to the leadership team, you know, in, in a somewhat, you know, experimental way and then show results, right? Because one of the issues here is credibility. We PMs have to be credible and they have to earn it. So that might be something, you know, where you can earn credibility and just show it can be done in a different way. Great. Thanks, Rafael. Um, as you touched uh, briefly on the differences between B2C and B2B products, uh, can you elaborate on the PM roles and organizational differences that tackle both types? Yeah, I'm actually a fan of not mentally becoming a B2C PM or a B2B PM, because I think it's very easy to think, oh, it's all very different, but I think the craft is the same. And, and the, what I mean by that is it's all about having a great product for specific customer needs and refining that and growing it, right? And that's not different B2C, B2B. Um, one thing that is always a bit, let's say, easier in B2B is that often you have existing customers, you know, you can interview them, you can talk to them. Um, but the trap with that is often you only incrementally innovate, right? Uh, that's the classical trap of B2B companies that they just, you know, keep on doing what they're doing. Uh, so B2C, on the other hand, often is, you know, a bit more open space. Uh, so you can really do base innovations there. But then again, you don't have customers maybe in the first place. Um, so that might be different. But again, I think I, I would mentally recommend to not think about it that differently, because I think the core discipline, what problem for which user or which segment are we solving and how could we delight them by doing that is actually very simple. Great. Thanks, Rafael. And the book um, that so I mentioned, Empowered, by the way, is, is, is generally something I would strongly recommend. It's one of the best books out there. And I don't think, for example, in that book, there's a difference between the two. It's, it's generally a good, a good reference for how to do it well. Yep. Yep. And that's Marty Kagan is the author of that book exactly. uh, for those of you exactly. that are searching. And he's also written another book called Inspired, uh, which yes. is also very good uh, in terms of developing product skills, understanding how product fits in the organization, building the right product and building the product right. That's really what he he touches on. Um, good. Next question. Um, and actually, I want to I want to take a, a spin on this. So there's a question. What are the best methods to learn um, user customer perspective, especially in B2B product. But actually, I want to ask Mark first, as organizations are looking for people with consumer experience, are you seeing a demand for people that have a background in uh, user insights, in consumer insights, in customer? So are people, are organizations looking for people that have kind of direct experience with customers, even people in sales, and looking for that transition into product at all? Uh, interesting question. I, I didn't hear it yet that much from uh, clients. I think what I've seen more often is a transition from marketing to product and back and forth. Um, so marketing and product, yes. I think that's um, there's a nice breathing between both spheres uh, in, in both directions. Uh, less so uh, direct sales, I'd say, if that makes sense. Got it. Okay. And, and Raphael, what do you think in terms of what are the best ways other than just getting out there and talking to them? Are there, are there other, other ways to get customer perspective that you've found, especially in B2B, to be most effective? Yeah. yeah. So I think what we're talking here again is the left sphere, the what we're building and not the how. And I think, so that sphere is often called product discovery. And, and at this point, there's actually, you know, lots of books written. Again, Marty Kagan is a fantastic resource. If, if you just look up Google uh, product discovery, you will, you will see a lot of things. And essentially, it's, it, you know, this is qualitative stuff. This is things like observing users, talking to users, asking a lot of why questions. There's quantitative stuff, right? Looking at usage looking at, at behaviors at scale, looking at logs. Um, but yeah, there is, there is, this is actually, this is a solved problem. Um, and I would say my, the key word for now, because we're time constrained here, I would say, look up product discovery and see what, you know, what you can learn from it. 
Great. Thank you. I want to jump a little bit. Um, there's a question. Do you think a full, relevant as we're in an INSEAD audience here, uh, do you think a full-time MBA can provide an aspiring PM the necessary skill sets and leadership qualities able to grow in, uh, in the role and be a successful PM? Um, I want to take my own perspective on that, which is a deeply biased one, um, uh, which, you know, I, I think that a lot of the individual level skill sets, right? The consumer insights, you can take courses on that. The um, organizational behavior courses where you're dealing with multiple stakeholders and managing groups and teams. How do you lead with formal authority, without formal authority? How do you drive change? Um, those kinds of things exist in the in organization, uh, in MBA programs. And in fact, at both INSEAD and here at Irvine, we actually have courses on design thinking, on product management. What are the skill sets? That said, my experience as, as a bit of an outsider is it's something that you need to learn by doing. And this, I would argue that that's true with many things uh, in the world, including a lot of the other jobs that people go into with an MBA, right? You got to learn it by doing it. That's easier said than done. Um, I do think that the skill sets necessary to make you effective right out of the gate are there, but then you're really only going to develop um, once you get on the ground and start doing it. That's that's my perspective. Rafael, I don't know, do you, what, how do you feel about that? Having having an MBA and having been in product? Yeah, I'm, I I think it's helpful. I, I still owe INSEAD a lot. Uh, and I think it made me a better, you know, uh, manager and leader. And, and exactly like you said, the, the, I don't want to call it soft skills, but basically the people skills, the convincing skills, the communication skills. And yes, the product skills itself have to be experienced. And learned. So yes, I agree in short. And if Great. I may, um, you know, and Rafael, ahead, I, yeah, Mark, we, see it, we see it in a lot of talent, right? A lot of the top product leaders we see actually have a background similar to Raphael's, which uh, where at some step of the journey, the MBA is there. So uh, I would agree to everything you said, but I would say it's a common thread uh, we often see. There's actually funnily, there might be even a funny self-selection going on. I'm just sharing maybe a bit of a personal thing here. You know, I've been a computer scientist. I mean, I, I didn't say that, but I studied computer science. But there's always, I always felt like I'm not, not only am I never going to be a great computer scientist, I actually might not even enjoy it much, right? So I, I love tech and I, I love computer science, but at the same time, I always felt a bit of a void and gap and felt, you know, I'm also enjoying the people side of things and the innovation and business side of things. So I think the MBA is maybe also like, it just draws people that maybe want to break out of a pure functional thing and then, you know, move on. So, so yeah, that's maybe a pattern we're also seeing here generally with MBAs that want to learn and expand their, their skill set. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure that amongst the graduating MBA, MBA cohort uh, at INSEAD now, it's become the second most popular or in-demand uh, job function is product behind. If you attended NCAD, you know what the number one answer is, consulting. Uh, but yes, it's now become the number two um, most desired job after NCAD. Um, good. Next question. So, so Rafael, you alluded to some challenges you see when product is placed under the CTO in organizations. And, and you said we can sort of talk about that later. A number of people would like to hear you talk about that. Um, so can you, can you give your perspective on why you think that, wh where you think some benefits are, but also where there are challenges that arise? Yeah. And then, by the way, I'm sure Mark also has a perspective on this. So my I'm skeptical. And the reason is that I... Am I making an assumption here with this question, right? That we're talking about a somewhat old school CTO setup, right? So people that were uh, really running, you know, IT and and tech and engineering, right? And that is the type of city we're talking about here. Then I think back to my two spheres. I think you would put the how the the what sphere, like what are we building? Strictly into an execution department, like into the right sphere, right? Look, and I've seen all the creativity, all the innovation, all the stuff I've talked about that you need in the left sphere, get killed by that, right? If 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 uh, if people don't understand it. But having said that, I wanna be open-minded, right? And I wouldn't rule out that there's a generation of CTOs that, that do get that, right? But then my question would rather be, why would you build a, an artificial hierarchy here uh, versus, for example, mixing it? Like I've seen CTPOs and I've seen actually CTOs and CPOs be separate uh, in the board. But Mark, I'm sure you have a perspective on this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we see less and less, uh, luckily, uh, of uh, product management being under a CTO, sometimes occasionally. Um, 
and we see different routes because there was also a question to the CPTO. Um, and in the other cases, we see a healthy tension between both, right? Because they sh it's often said that they should be um, on, um, on eye level. What I would say is, and I had a discussion actually, there was the product management festival just last week. It was an interesting one where there was even a challenge. Do you need a CTO at all? Or is actually the CPO taking on the overall responsibility? And then you have more of VP of engineering to, to get things done. That was another discussion uh, on the side there. And I would definitely say that if the creative part is, um, is important, I level is, uh, is, is, is the baseline, right? Because otherwise you will not build new stuff. You will prioritize more probably improving things incrementally. And um, we, and some, but there's also the, the self um, perception, I think of the CPOs, not all CPOs wanna have uh, all of engineering in their remit. Some find it limiting, at least Rafael, that's what I heard was speaking with some. And I spoke with someone who from CPO moved to CPTO and was then relieved once you could let go. So it's also kind of what's your personal aspiration, I think, which is important to consider. Great, um, thank you. So gotten a number of questions, um, obviously about getting into this uh, field. And so Mark, I think maybe this might be a good place for you to start us off. Um, you know, what do you think about entering the product career, whether it's PM or, or product leader right now, given the current economic client climate, the fact that a lot of the big tech companies have just had massive layoffs, but it's certainly not uh, exclusive to tech at all. Um, just any any thoughts on getting into this, uh, given everything that's that's been transpiring in the last couple of weeks? Mm -hmm. So the discussions also uh, with clients and at events, um, of course, there are layoffs throughout. We see on the strong engineering product side, I would see we see less and we see it also quickly absorbed in the market. So I, I, from, from our vantage point, we would say there's a continuous high demand for product because it's still, this, the, the skill in companies is still building up. So we would still rate it uh, an absolute good area um, to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. And, and do you see differences in tech and non-tech? There are a couple of questions about people that are getting it, that want to get into product outside of the tech space. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, from personal experience, every time we run PMEP, we always have sort of one to four people who come in and this one works in building tractors and that one works in flooring and, and everybody else kind of looks at them and, and at first like, whoa, what are you doing here? And then actually they have a lot to offer. So I think they kind of get brushed aside, Pro non-tech product gets kind of put aside, but actually is, is probably, I would imagine, you know, is growing in the same way, just a little bit more off the radar. Any, anything that you're seeing about that? Absolutely. I actually saw uh, at an e-commerce company, a CPO who actually started off with uh, physical goods. So, and he, he found that skill set absolutely um, helpful. Um, I think one advice would be to understand what the company means with product management, because it could be a very different thing to what you might expect. So I think probing that in an interview process with, an, with a company, with a potential employer, and really getting to a full understanding what they mean by that. That's my, in your own due diligence, I think really important point. Got it. Rafael, do anything you want to add about, about non, because at peak, I would imagine you're probably dealing mostly with tech. Um, anything that you're seeing around non-tech or any advice you have for people that are interested in that? Yeah, actually, I have a. We don't actually only do tech, to uh, to be clear. Um, and I I do think it would be self limiting to only think about product in tech because I mean the world is is still a lot of physical stuff. Right? And talk about delightful products. I'm sure if all of us would think about you know products we really love, I'm sure a lot of them are physical. Right? And I mean I leave it to your own imagination to to do that exercise. And and things like industrial design, right? Or design actually often has a physical component to it right so but I would echo what Mark said I think for me the key is is the company innovative is the company aiming to 
you know, lead by product, drive with product, and whether the product is software and hardware only, software or hardware only, really doesn't matter, right? I mean, I remember like the design icon, iconic companies, right? Um, that are mostly hardware, right? But they have exactly that philosophy to, you know, let the product speak for itself, and then you know everything else is, is secondary. So, yeah. So I would I would qualify that. I would talk to managers. I would talk uh, maybe when you interview, you know, have a just check out the company. And and again, I love my uh, or, or this, you know, the statement of you cannot uh, PowerPoint your way to a great product, right? How do they think about, you know, innovation? How do they think about the next set of features, right? How do they choose them? How do they validate them, right? Or is it, you know, the executives going on a retreat and say, okay, we have the answer, right? These are the five features we need, right? Those will all, you know, but you will feel it. You will see, actually, you will, you will see it if you, if you use the products. I think, you know, do they delight you? Yeah, so we may we probably have time for one or two more questions. The one that's actually at the top of the list right now, I'm going to I'm going to put a little spin on it. The question is what is a product what is the product market fit approach um or a model that you like? I think that's pretty specific and it's a technical skill or it's a skill that there's lots of information out there about. However, I will say let's take a step back and say are there any specific approaches or models that you think are particularly helpful that you find to be most useful that you find yourself turning back to most frequently, Raphael? Yeah. I think in business, again, back to my two spheres, we're always drawn to the efficiency sphere, to the right one, to the process one, to predictability, to you know, planning, business planning, budgets, headcount, you know. So that's the natural tendency to go there. So I would say, open your mind to the left side and learn about, you know, discovery, innovation, design thinking, design, and, you know, the creative side of things and also the customer side of things. But I think that is maybe the most underappreciated. And I think for a normal person, you know, that has general work experience, this might be maybe the most fascinating one, maybe the one that might just open you open your mind uh, um, the most. Um, the books I mentioned already. Maybe one quick thing on the product, uh, on the product market fit thing. This actually, I don't know how many of you have known this uh, expression. This is actually an, ex an imp expression that continues to fascinate me. And I'll, let me quickly explain it. Because um, it took me a while to really understand how genius this expression is. And like, in a very simple term, this product market fit is actually a complex optimization. So what I mean by that is, you know, success is binary, right? Like you're growing or not, a product is successful or not. But product market fit implies that we have at least two variables. One is the product, like how do you design the product, develop the product, how the product looks like, the feature sets, the trade-offs you're making. But the other one is the market, right? And market doesn't only mean a market segment. It might also also users, right? Like the, the specific, you know, uh, people that use it or buy it. And you can change both at the same time. So it becomes a quite a complex thing, right? You have, you might have a great product, but for a wrong market, or you might have a, a wrong product for the right market, right? So you can actually change both. We can win by changing the market as well. You don't always have to change the product, right? Uh, and then, yeah, there's their methods and we don't have time now for the details. There's one from a company called a Radical Studio that I like that shows sort of a dynamic flow of, of product market. But anyways, but it is a helpful um, framework to think about, you know, it's not you, it's not only what you want, it's the product and it's the specific segment or the user who you build this product for, right? It's it's actually a helpful direction to think that way. Great. Thank you, Raphael. Um, getting getting into the nuts and bolts, which I think a lot of people have interest in, and there's a lot of resources out there. Um, it, we're past time. Thank you to those of you that came today for asking questions. I'm sorry. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Um, an encouragement again to all of you to sign up for the product games finale next week at INSEAD. And um, just, you know, thank you to Mark and to Raphael for joining us, for sharing your knowledge and your time. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Take care, everyone. Bye.